Well, good morning again, everybody. It is good to, uh, to be here and to see everybody on a normal Sunday. Yeah. Where there's no, well, there might be a little bit of ice out there in a couple spots where the water's standing, but no snow, no ice, none of that bad stuff, all right? So uh, we are going to just continue in our, in our series, and uh, I'll say a little more about that in a bit, but... I don't know how long you have to commute to work, okay, to and from, you know, to your house and all that kind of stuff, but I don't think our commute would have even begun to compare to 58-year-old James Robertson, okay, and uh, this is a picture of James Robertson. Back in January of 2015, an article appeared in the Detroit Free Press about Mr. Robinson and how he walked a 21-mile round trip to get to his $10.55 an hour job each weekday. He had been doing this for 10 years because 10 years earlier, his car had broken down and he just didn't have the money uh, to buy a new one. And so part of his commute, okay, was by bus But 21 miles, he walked by foot, rain, shine, or snow. Now, his boss told reporters, I set our attendance standard by this man. I say if he can get here, walking all those miles through snow and rain, well, I tell you, he says, I have people in Pontiac 10 minutes away, and they say they can't get here. (laughs) And knowing that the average person, okay, can walk, one mile in 20 minutes, he has a seven-plus-hour commute to work each weekday, which means that he would only get a few hours of sleep each night. A 19-year-old teenager by the name of Evan Leedy, he happened to see this report in the paper about this guy and so he went online and he set up a a GoFundMe page on behalf of Mr. Robertson and this thing began to gain national attention and people began to be amazingly generous and it wasn't long until it ended up being that his GoFundMe page had profited $350,000 dollars mr robertson bought a car (laughs) and it was a ford taurus okay now generosity we think about that people being generous that is a great quality to have whether it's giving of your time whether it's giving of your talents or even your finances for somebody like a you know a james robertson but from a completely different perspective As someone who has been created by God, okay, as someone who has received his grace, as someone who has been gifted by his Holy Spirit, been blessed by God over and over again, folks, there is no greater cause to give towards than the Lord's church and his work on earth. Do you realize that the church is the only organization in the world that is meant to impact the eternal lives of people. Now, just for a moment, I want you to think about things that we would spend money on. Consider things like we spend money on a house, right? Uh, We spend money on a car. We spend money on food and gas and clothing and peanut M&Ms. I even, oh yeah, those are so good. Peanut M&Ms, I love them. And we spend money on things like insurance. Boy, doesn't that get you sometimes? You know, cable TV, internet services, phones, electricity, and on and on it goes. Now, there's nothing wrong, okay, with having those things, especially those peanut (laughs) M&Ms. But in the end, we got to think about all of those things that we spend our money on, those are all temporary things, aren't they? On the other hand, when we give to the Lord's church, that money is actually being used to help people discover a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's eternal. And that's something worth 
giving to. Now, I've been in this series, okay, on disciple DNA. And we've been talking just about things that, it's like, hey, what does a disciple, a follower of Jesus look like? And we've talked about several things like Bible study, and we've talked about uh, influencing people to follow Jesus. Uh, we have, uh, I'm trying to remember what the first one was. See, even the minister forgets what he did, you know, a few weeks back. But uh, we've looked at several, several concepts, and today is all about giving generously because God does expect us to give generously as his followers to his work on earth. Today, what I want us to do is I want us to consider a few lessons about giving generously from a biblical perspective. And here's the first lesson that, that I want us to learn today, and that is generosity should begin by giving 10% to the Lord's church. Now, I like the story about these two guys, okay? And these two guys, they uh, had a wreck out in the ocean and they, in their boat, and they got stranded on this island. And the first guy, I mean, he was just a mess. You know, he was pacing back and forth on the beach, and he was just beside himself. And, but the other guy, the second guy, he, he was just sitting there all calm, cool, and collective, you know. And, and the first guy said to the second guy, he said, aren't you afraid we're about to die? He said, no. He said, I make $100,000 every week, and I tithe to my church faithfully every Sunday. My pastor will find me. <laughs> hey, I tell you what, you know, when it comes to this concept of giving 10% of what I make back to the Lord's church, you might be thinking today, man, that is not the lesson I wanted to hear. Okay? Uh, there might be some other people, though, thinking, you know, well, I already give 10% to the Lord's church, so I'm okay with this lesson. And then there can still be some other people thinking today, you know what, well, let's see, the Old Testament required the Jews to give 10% back to God, uh, but in the New Testament, there's no specific percentage that's even given, so I can just give whatever I want. Now, whatever you may be thinking today, I just want to share a few thoughts, okay? I'm just going to start in the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, the word tithe, T-I-T-H-E, uh, which means 10% is the idea, uh, it appears in the Old Testament 29 times. Now, I just want to read one of those times. Here's what it says. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commands the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai for the Israelites. Now, here's the only principle that I want you to catch out of that verse, okay? And if you are taking notes today, I know I've got the principle in there. You can fill in the blank. Okay, a tithe to God was something that belonged to him and commanded by law. Okay, that's the only thing I want you to get. A tithe to God was something that belonged to him and commanded by law. Now let's fast forward to the New Testament, okay? And guess what? When you get to the New Testament, you're not going to find anything about giving 10%, okay, back to God. Really, all we find in the New Testament is this concept of give generously. Give generously. Now I'm just going to read one passage out of the New Testament. There are others that can be pointed to. This is one. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 11. The Apostle Paul's writing to the Corinth church, okay, and he says, hey, uh, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly 
or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to who? To God. Now, I want you to think about some of those concepts in there. Uh, if you give sparingly, you will reap sparingly. Okay, if you sow generously, you will reap generously. It says there in that text, and God is able to bless you abundantly. It also says that you will be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. Now, from the New Testament, here's the only principle that I want you to catch from that scripture, okay? Here it is. God is going to bless those who give generously to the Lord's work on earth. Now, after saying that, okay, I am not saying that God is going to make you a millionaire when you give 10% to the Lord's church, okay? I know that's not true because my wife and I have done that and even beyond that ever since we've been married for 32 years, all right? If that were true, we would all be giving 20%. <laughs> so we could be multi-millionaires, <laughs> right? All I'm saying is that in God's economy, God is going to bless those who give generously to his work on earth. Now, folks, how he chooses to bless you is up to his business, all right? The only thing I'm thinking about is, man, don't you want God's blessing on your life? Think about that. I want that. Now, it is true, okay? In the Old Testament, the standard of generosity began at 10%. And uh, you know what? We're not living under the Old Testament law anymore, right? And so we get to the New Testament, we don't find any specific percentage, and I'm going to tell you why. And I've already hinted at it, and that is we don't live under the Old Testament law anymore, right? We live under the New Testament covenant of grace, and get this, where the sky is the limit. That means we could actually move beyond 10%, and we'd go to 11%, and 12%, and 15%. You see, the standard of giving is not 10% by law. The standard if, is to give generously by God's grace. And you think about it, okay, to be honest, okay? Now, I don't know if this is true of you, but if your family, if you make $150,000 plus a year, tithing could be actually used as an excuse to not give more generously. And so again, there is no specific percentage given in the New Testament, but here's my question. Do we honestly believe that God would want us to give less under a New Testament covenant of grace than what the Jews were required to give under law? You see, I am convinced and I am convicted that giving 10% of my income or more back to the Lord's work on earth is a great place to start. Studies reveal, okay, now get this. Studies reveal that only 3 to 5% of Christians actually tithe. That means if, just to make it simple, if there are 100 giving units in a church, only three to five of those families actually tithe. Statistics across the board. 37%, and this has always surprised me, 37% of people who attend church every week and identify themselves as evangelical Christians don't give any money to their church. Wow. So here's my challenge for you today, okay? If you are giving something back to the Lord's work on earth when you get paid, but you're not giving 10%, I want to challenge you to start giving 10% next week. 
Okay, if you're giving nothing to the Lord's church, I want to challenge you to start giving 5% next Sunday for the first six months. Become accustomed to that in your budget. And then when it gets to September 1st of this year, you're going to begin giving 10% to the Lord's church. So that means this. Just to make it easy. If you make $1,000 a week in your house, that means you make $52,000 a year. Now, I think the average income for Warren County, I was checking on some of this stuff, I believe it's not the average, it, it, they call it the medium household income, okay? In other words, if you take everybody's income in Warren County and you were to line it up right in the middle is 42000 and some odd dollars, okay? That's the median in Warren County. Well, let's just say it's 52000 That means, okay, how much is 10% of that? A hundred, right? If you need to start off at 5%, how much is that? That's $50. So that's what you'd be giving back to the Lord's work on earth. Here's a second lesson that I want us to move on to. And uh, we'll get away from the 10% thing, all right? But we'll move on to the next lesson. And that is, this is important. Your generosity benefits the advancement of God's mission on earth. Listen, every Sunday when we pass around the offering place, basically what happens is, is we are joining all of our resources in order to advance God's mission on earth because we want to spread the word, okay? We want to spread his love. We want to spread his grace to other people who really need it. Now, in Matthew chapter 28, we know that Jesus gave us a great commission, right? I mean, he told us, he said, you need to go and you need to make disciples, and he even included in there of all nations. Now, Warrington Christian Church, okay, we reflect the heart of that mission with this statement. And this is our mission statement. And that is, we are here. Why do we exist? We exist to invite people to discover a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Listen, when you give your money to this church, that's the mission that it's used for that we are going to invite people to discover a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Wayne Smith, he tells about the time when a lady asked him, uh, uh, she said, uh, Wayne, if I don't tithe, am I going to go to hell? And Wayne Smith, he said, no, but maybe somebody else will. Wow. To realize that the gift of your investment is helping this church reach people for Jesus and to actually save them from an eternity in hell. That is a powerful thought. That's eternal. And I think that ought to motivate us to give generously. Now, let's just break it down a little bit. Some of the money that is given here at this church, okay, well, what's it used for? Well, some of us used to, uh, to keep this building up and going to, to pay the, the, uh, the, uh, the mortgage. And, and those are things that you need to understand. I think you need to understand that the mortgage on this church building right now is 4000 and it's like $500 a month, right around there. This church still owes... Now, I'm taking some guesses a little bit, okay? But this church still owes, uh, I think it's a little, maybe is it, is it, I, is it like $475,000? Right around there. Now, it doesn't sound too exciting to give money to keep the building afloat, does it? I mean, that don't sound too exciting. I mean, you have a mortgage probably, you know? But listen, when you consider what takes place at this building, I'm glad we have it. Aren't you? I mean, this is a place where we gather every Sunday to worship God and we gather to actually get inspiration for the week to come. This is a place where children are taught, where Bible studies take place, where fellowship occurs. This is where I actually have an office. 
okay? And, and I come here and I study. And, and I pray and I plan for the future of the congregation. This is a place where student activities, like junior high through high school, they, they have activities here. Now, some of the money you use to pay, yeah, it, it's to pay staff like myself. Some is used to pay for things like books and computers and curriculum and communion supplies and utility bills. And, and I think it's good to understand as a congregation, you know what, there are times because of what is given each Sunday that there are sometimes choices are made. Well, we can't do that. Or, well, we can't do this because the money's not there. Some of what you give is used to support missionaries around the word or world or also in the United States. Uh, 10% of everything that's given here actually goes back to support missions. Now, from a local standpoint, I wanted to introduce something that is new for the church, new for the congregation, and that is we, are, we have begun to support a local organization called Jordan's Place that's right here in Warrington. Uh, it was started by the Claude Felter family as a result of their 17-year-old son dying from a drug overdose. It's a place where teenagers can go here in town. They can actually go there after school. It's a safe environment. Uh, they can play games. Uh, they receive mentoring and support from positive adults. There is job search assistance for those uh, teens. There is a family dinner that they have every third Sunday of the month. Okay? And it's this Sunday dinner every third Sunday of the month that we as a congregation, we are going to begin to go up and feed some families that actually utilize uh, Jordan's Place, okay? And these are families that I have no idea, but I think they're from a very different backgrounds, a lot of different needs. And so like on March the 18th, that's the third Sunday in March, we're going to do this every other month. And so we're going to be taking off after church. They serve a lunch at 1 o'clock and to about anywhere from 40 to 60 people. And we're going to go up there and we're going to help feed those families. We can talk to them, spend time with them. Uh, we're going to be up there for a few hours. But it's just a great opportunity, I think, for our congregation to make a connection with a local organization that's doing some good things in the community, all right? they do a whole lot more than than what I'm talking about here is a video that I want you to watch and in this video I think it really gets to the heart of where our money goes well I think those images pretty much represent a lot about what our money goes toward let's go to the third lesson and that is generosity benefits you there are three things that I want to go through and we won't spend a ton of time on them but these are good benefits okay when you give you will experience God's generosity the Bible does teach us over and over again that when we give okay we will benefit here are just some passages to think about Luke 6 38 Jesus said give and it'll be given to you the good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. In the context of God meeting needs in our life, Jesus said in Matthew six thirty three, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things... And we would say things like food, clothing, and shelter will be given to you as well. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 19, And my God will meet all your needs according to, his, according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So you see, when we give with the right motive, God gives to us. Here's benefit number two. When you give, you will remain free 
from materialism. I quoted from Matthew 6, 33 uh, earlier, and here's what it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, and the implication is like food, clothing, shelter, our needs, okay? These things will be given to you as well. And so you think about that, okay, putting God's kingdom first, that means that some of my money is going to be given to the Lord's church. Now I want you to think about this, okay? If you give 3% selfishly or 10% reluctantly, it's evidence that money has a grip, okay, on your life. John Maxwell, he said, the true test of stewardship is not what your money is doing for you, but what it's doing to you. If you can't bring yourself to give without some kind of negative response, it means that there's a spiritual issue going on that really needs to be addressed so that money doesn't become more important than God. But when you give with a cheerful heart, it is evidence that you are free from the grip of materialism. Here's benefit number three, and that is when you give, you will grow and increase in your faith. Listen, when you boil it all down, and this is a very important point, I, I think, when you boil it all down, it requires trust to give back to God, doesn't it? It surely does. Now I think about how, I think about how like Bible study, okay? We talk about Bible study. We talk about prayer. Uh, we talk about how like trials in our life, you know, it can actually cause our faith to grow, okay? And to increase. But so can giving financially to the Lord's church. I mean, every time you think, every time you write out a check to Warrington Christian Church, or every time you give online, or every time you give some cash, you are demonstrating a trust in God when you do that, okay? You are putting your hope in God. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says, command those who are rich in this present world. Now, some of us might say, well, I'm not rich, so this doesn't apply to me. Listen, uh, when you take the whole world in consideration, even if you're on welfare, you are in the top 5% of the entire world. That's amazing. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. The reason some people have problems with giving is it really is their hope and trust is in their money to meet their needs rather than having their hope in God to meet those needs. So a great act of trust, again, is every time you write out that check to Warrington Christian Church or every time you give online, that is a great act of trust when you get paid rather than waiting to the end of the week to see what's left over. I think there's a big difference between giving off the top and giving off the bottom. Giving off the top says, God, we really don't know what this week, let alone this month, means for us financially, but we trust you to make do with what's left. See, that's an attitude of someone who is growing and increasing in their faith. Let's all bow our heads and let's pray as we get ready for our decision time. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for just your blessings in our life. And I pray, God, that depending on where we're at spiritually from this perspective and in our finances, God, I pray that you'd help us to make right decisions. I pray that you would help us to grow and increase in our faith. And God, help us to recognize the giver of all things through what we give. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You know, I think today, okay, when I talk about the subject of money, it can be one of those moments where, you know, maybe it can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable, especially for those who, you know, 
give nothing or those who give sporadically. And the good news is uh, you, you, you've got some choices here, okay? And the good news is you can start to give generously from this day forward. And maybe this is something that you really need to talk about. I think that's healthy. You can talk about this as you go home today. Because maybe it's something you, you really need to talk about, especially as a husband and wife. Now, if you're a single person, I understand, you know. You can talk to yourself going home today, okay? But it's probably something you need to talk about. As we've done each week, I just want you to imagine that you are standing in front of the mirror at home. And as you stand in front of the mirror, you are looking and gazing at yourself. And as you see yourself, I just want you to think about, okay, what kind of Christian have you become? What kind of follower have you become? Do you see somebody who gives generously or do you see somebody who says, I want to keep most of it to myself? As far as your DNA as a disciple... Giving generously is what God expects, okay? It's part of being a follower of Jesus. It's a part of, be, of your DNA as a Christian. And listen, it's just who you are. Now, we've come to our decision time, and I want you to know I did it on purpose, okay? I put our communion and offering after my message today. So let's make no bones about it. You don't even have to think about it. The preacher did that on purpose. Okay, And I did that because I want us to have an opportunity to actually act on the message. And I want us to have the opportunity to say, I am putting my trust in God and I'm not putting it in money to meet my needs. I'm, I'm putting it in God to meet my needs. Now listen, my wife and I, uh, when I first, when I, when I entered the ministry, okay, and I went full-time in 1986, I was a youth minister. My full-time pay was $14,500, okay? And I always said, praise God, my wife is working, or I couldn't even be in ministry. But my wife didn't make very much back then either, and we gave 10%. I remember, that's a whole story in itself that I'll probably tell sometime, but I remember when we literally got down, we were making a payment on a house that had not sold. We were now ministering in a different town, but we were down to the last $50 to our name. But we still gave, when I got paid, we still gave 10%. It wasn't even a question. And now at this point in life, hey, I make more money than I did when I first entered ministry. You need to know you're not paying me $14,500 a year, all right? But listen, we still give 10%, and we give even more. And so it's feasible. You can do it. You can honor God by doing that. We've done it our whole life. At this time, our decision time, listen, if you have a decision... Please come to the back. Let's stand and let's sing.